afternoon or good morning to everyone if you are joining us from the West Coast. My name is Lucy Marie Sabucci. I am the Senior Manager of Immunize Canada. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Reducing Pain and Fear, Integrating Evidence into Routine Immunization Practice, offered by PHPC in partnership with Immunize Canada. The moderator of this webinar, I would like to bring to your attention the learning objectives. So at the end of this webinar, you will be able to firstly discuss the relativeness of pain and fear to the practice of immunization, recognize the existing knowledge to care gap in clinical practice, identify adoptable interventions for clinicians that can improve immunization acceptance and uptake in infants, children and adults, and of course acquire new knowledge that can be disseminated amongst your colleagues. I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anna Taddeo. Dr. Anna Taddeo is a professor of pharmacy at the University of Toronto and senior associate scientist at SickKids. Dr. Taddeo studies pain man management during needle procedures in children. She currently leads a national working group, Help Eliminate Pain in Kids and Adults, which studies and promotes effective pain management during vaccination. I would like to now welcome Dr. Taddeo to deliver. Thank you for the opportunity to present about managing pain and fear during vaccination. The title of my presentation is Reducing Pain and Fear, Integrating Evidence into Routine Immunization Practice. First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my, my disclosures. I've worked in the area of pain management for over 20 years, and particularly uh, procedural pain management in children. My work's funded primarily by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, or CIHR, but at present I'm receiving funding from Pfizer for an independent investigator-driven trial trying to reduce pain during vaccination, and I received study supplies for this trial from two companies that distribute analgesic interventions, Natus and Ferndale. I want to thank my research collaborators, many of whom belong to the Help in Kids team, which stands for Help Eliminate Pain in Kids. This is an interdisciplinary team of individuals involved in pain and vaccination at different levels that I lead, which is carrying out work to try to improve pain management practices during immunization. And much of the information I'll be presenting today is from work we have done within the scope and mandate of Help in Kids. I also want to thank the organizations that have been involved in our efforts to improve vaccination pain management. The likelihood that we can make a real difference to the pain care gap is dramatically increased by having the right people involved. So thank you to all of these organizations for their participation and their support. Here's a roadmap of the presentation today, and I call it the road to happy vaccination. I will first start by introducing the problem of pain, then some solutions we have to offer, and what we've been doing to try to get the word out. So first, to talk about the problem of pain. Needles are ubiquitous in our healthcare system. Many people are quite unaware of the burden of pain that's actually placed on society from needles. Experience with needle pain begins as soon as a baby's born. All neonates have a painful procedure done as part of regular medical care. At the time they're born, they get vitamin K injection, and then 24 hours later, they get the newborn screening test. And then we have the immunizations that carry on throughout childhood and into adulthood. And if people are compliant, they'll have four or more dozen vaccine injections by the time they're adults. And for children that are hospitalized, the burden of pain is further increased. They endure, on average, about one painful procedure every day. And if people have a chronic disease like cystic fibrosis or diabetes, they undergo many, many more procedures. So clearly, a lot of pokes are part of regular care. In general, there's no acknowledging needle pain as an issue in society. People in general are ignorant of what's really going on, particularly with children when they're undergoing needles. Here are some images of children undergoing painful procedures, and in this case, vaccination, and it doesn't look like there's any pain or any fear about pain. Where did I get these images? From public health websites and public health brochures. And it looks like everything is great, 
There's no hint of pain, no acknowledgement whatsoever. These are happy, willing, compliant, and unbothered clients, families, and immunizers. But when you ask stakeholders like parents what immunization is really like, they paint a different picture. They say immunizations are actually quite, quite challenging. There are some challenges that are involved that are listed on this slide. The primary one is that kids cry, otherwise they scream, flail. They need to be restrained to be able to carry out the procedure. They try to run away and they kick and they do some other things that are not mentioned on this slide just because it happens less frequently. When we further inquire about what parents are doing to mitigate these challenges, this is what they say. They most commonly report that they try to hold their children, they reassure them, prepare them ahead of time, try to distract them, they themselves act calm, they empathize, and they use oral analgesics. What's interesting about this uh, um, list of things that they do is that almost half of the things that they do don't really help to reduce pain and distress in their kids and may actually make things worse. So not only are parents doing things that they should be doing, they're actually doing things that may make distress greater during vaccine injections. Unfortunately, few children benefit from interventions that have established effectiveness for reducing vaccination pain, including sweet tasting agents, most commonly sucrose solution, which is used in infants, and topical anesthetics, which is effective in individuals of all ages. And when it comes to immunizers themselves, they also are uncertain even about the injection technique that they should be using that minimizes pain. Should they inject vaccines quickly or slowly? Do they aspirate or not? And even though at present it's quite clear that aspiration is not a necessary part of the procedure and it's no longer recommended, there's still quite a few people that do continue to aspirate during vaccine injections even though this does cause quite a bit more pain. So the result is that vaccinations actually look more like this than the pictures that we show people from our pamphlets. You see that there's pain, there's fears, and individuals can be very distressed during vaccination. So notice I replaced the previous pictures with other pictures that I took from media websites. Uh, so all I did was type in the word uh, immunization and vaccination under Google and these questions, as these pictures come out quite easily and more accurately re reflect what the experience of vaccination is. Needles hurt people, plain and simple. And of course, I already introduced the issue of fear of needles. The most common question a child has when they enter a doctor's office is, am I getting a needle today? And they are preoccupied with needles and with pain. Needle fears are more common than people realize. I'm sure everyone knows someone who has a needle fear. We recently surveyed almost 2,000 children and parents at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto to see how prevalent needle fears were and found that about a quarter of parents were afraid of the needle and about two-thirds of kids were afraid of needles. And the fear was uh, not all a high fear. They were divided into low, moderate, and a lot of fear, but you can see there's quite a few people who actually have a lot of fear. And what's interesting here is if you have fear, it actually feeds pain. So if you've devel developed a fear of needles or you're afraid of needles, then this actually makes you experience more pain. And how do people experience fear or how do they learn to be afraid? Well, they are finding that the needle is threatening to them. So this sort of makes sense. And you should actually be afraid of needles because they do have the potential to hurt you. But if you have a particularly traumatizing experience with a needle, usually this happens in childhood, you become afraid of needles and this fear can persist over the lifetime. So while kids tend to be more afraid or more of them are afraid of needles than adults, there are people who continue to have needle fears into adulthood. As you saw, about a quarter of adults report that they have fears and these are usually acquired in childhood. But they don't actually need to be acquired by experiencing pain yourself. You can watch someone else have a particularly traumatizing experience with a needle to become afraid, or someone can just scare you into becoming afraid. 
So the problem with having a natal fear is not so much that you're afraid, but it's the consequences of being afraid. And the consequences of, of being afraid is that you will be non-compliant with vaccination and other healthcare interventions. So here you see the estimates for how many people across the lifespan are non-compliant specifically with vaccination because of their concerns about pain or needle fears. So parents are concerned on behalf of their kids. So either their kids have a needle fear or they don't like to see their kids suffering. So about 10% of them will be non-compliant with vaccination for this reason. You have a, then across the lifespan when people are old enough to make their own decisions, decisions, people deciding not to vaccinate, where the primary reason is because of fear, again, in about 10% of uh, cases, and maybe a little bit higher in adolescents who are particularly concerned and for the first time can uh, say on behalf of themselves that they don't want to be vaccinated. Even if people are compliant with vaccination, however, they still have concerns about pain and the concerns about fear. So at least a third of parents who are, co who are compliant with vaccination also mention pain and fear as a problem during vaccination. The majority of parents say they themselves would be less anxious if, they're, if the vaccines were given to their kids in a non-painful way. And most parents say that immunizers should do more to make vaccines less painful, and they themselves would want to learn more about what they can do to help their children because this isn't information that they learn anywhere. This slide summarizes what I've said so far. For individuals, the consequence of not treating pain is that people suffer unnecessarily and there are treatments that we can give them so I'll tell you about that uh, but besides that that makes them of course less satisfied with the care that they receive in the health context they can acquire needle fears and this can lead to non-compliance behaviors and the non-compliance behaviors can go beyond vaccine injection they can be non-compliant with other health interventions where they think or that there is a needle attached to part of that care and this may subsequently cause poorer health outcomes because people are not getting the treatments that they need. On the right side of the slide shows you the impact of not treating pain on a health systems and health provider level. We have suboptimal quality of care being delivered. We have healthcare providers that are dissatisfied with their jobs. We have healthcare providers who themselves choose to be not compliant with administering the recommended number of vaccines to try to reduce the burden of pain for kids predominantly. And then this also ultimately leads to suboptimal health outcomes. Interesting, when we ask children about vaccination pain, they demonstrate that they're quite in tune with all the issues involved, and they all think pain should be routinely managed. Besides what children want, there's also an ethical and moral obligation to minimize harm. Causing undue pain is simply not justifiable at all. And this slide summarizes why we have this pain care gap. So you might be wondering if pain is so bad and consumers want something done about it, why hasn't it been addressed until now? Well, there are lots of reasons and the barriers uh, obviously are winning over the, the uh, facilitators or the truths as you see here from the balance and the uh, lower side, which is the barrier side. And these are the prevailing myths about pain that prevent us from doing something. So firstly, parents and clinicians don't know what they can do to reduce pain. They think that uh, pain is the necessary evil, so it's the trade-off we have to have to, in order to have the benefits of immunization. They don't know that they can have it both ways. They can have good health care and they can have no pain. And the truth is that the information that we know about how to manage pain is fairly new compared to other health areas so not everyone knows that there are things that we can do to manage pain. Next is the idea about whose responsibility it is to manage pain. Since the injection is part of the immunization process and immunizers need to follow best practices which involve good injection practice and minimizing pain and the fact that pain is an unintended harm implies that it is actually the responsibility of the healthcare providers and the healthcare system that it's, that's administering the vaccines to also minimize pain. 
There's also a notion here that the procedure only lasts a minute and the consequences only last a minute. But while the needle injection itself may only last a minute, the consequences of pain can last considerably longer. So people who can acquire, a, as I said, a needle fear, they can have that needle fear persist throughout their life time. So the fact that the procedure only lasts a minute doesn't mean that the consequences of pain last a minute. We also have the notion um, that people believe that analgesics don't work or they can't be implemented within current workflows without adding too much time or money, but this is not true. Drugs that we use for immunization pain management are effective and safe and they can be easily incorporated into uh, practice. Most analgesic interventions cost no money at all. There's also a prevailing view by many healthcare professionals that analgesics are not really all that helpful. So people will say things like, but the child or the baby cried out anyway, even when we tried to give sugar water or even when we gave topical anesthetics. But what's important is not only did they feel pain, but how much pain did they feel? And when we give them analgesics, they cry less. They have less distress. So that's proven. Ideally, we want to do everything we can to prevent pain and prevent fear. But even if we can't prevent it, we still want to minimize it. And most drugs work this way. They reduce, but they don't necessarily eliminate symptoms of a condition, so they don't always have an all or none effect. And when we don't have the uh, effects that we want, we add on new therapies or we add on more interventions to try to get that pain or get that fear to zero. And for some reason, pain medication is judged by a higher standard than other drugs, and we think that if we didn't prevent pain, that it wasn't worth it to even try to make it a little bit less. But finally, the primary reason that people say they don't manage pain is not that they don't want to, it's that they actually don't know what to do. So no parent and no clinician really wants to see people suffer, yet no one is telling them how to help. On the, right, on the left side of the uh, slide, you can see the truths about pain, which are that if you manage pain, you will get less pain, you will have people have less fear in the future, you will improve their satisfaction with the health care you give them and improve compliance with needle procedures. So the good news is that there's lots we can do to mitigate pain. And for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to review some of the evidence from our new clinical practice guideline about what can be done to mitigate pain. And the interventions fall into four different categories. We call the four P's of pain management. Procedural interventions, which involve procedure techniques. Physical interventions, which involve body position and activity. Pharmacological interventions, so the drug therapies we can use. And psychological interventions, so these involve thoughts and behaviors. You'll notice as I go through these that most of them are cost neutral and feasible for any practice setting so but for having to tell somebody to do this or to teach them about it it can be done without incurring extra costs so the first uh, intervention group or category are the procedural interventions and i've listed here some of the interventions that help with some pictures beside them the first Intervention involves the method by which we inject the vaccine. If vaccines are being administered intramuscularly, avoid aspiration as this is an unnecessary step and it adds a lot of needle contact time and tissue damage because of the needle wiggling in the tissue while you're trying to aspirate and this increases uh, pain. Sometimes people are getting multiple vaccines injected sequentially in the same visit. If this is being done, inject the most painful vaccine last because what happens is with every injection you give or every noxious stimulus, you are sensitizing to the body to it. So you have more and more pain. And if you start with something that's more painful, you actually end up with more pain at the end. So it's better to start with low pain and then end with high pain. The next interventions, the number three and number four, uh, apply to infants. Again, if you're giving multiple injections in the same sitting, it's possible to have two immunizers injecting in alternate limbs at the same time for the first two injections in infants or simultaneous injections. Obviously, you'd need more immunizers to be able to carry out this intervention, but this reduces pain in infants, probably because you're not uh, sensitizing or revving up the nervous system 
as I just previously mentioned, but this intervention is not demonstrated to be helpful when kids are older, uh, when they develop uh, stranger anxiety, and you might actually elevate their fear by having two immunizers come at them from two different sides. So it's not recommended after kids develop that stranger anxiety. And finally, at the bottom, site of administration. In some areas, not necessarily in Canada, but in some regions, people have a choice about injecting vaccines in the leg, the upper thigh in uh, infants, or injecting in the deltoid muscle. And injecting in the thigh, there's some evidence that that's also associated with less pain. Here's a list of the physical interventions that can be used to minimize pain. Breastfeeding is at the top. Breastfeeding is actually a combined intervention. It combines physical comfort, the closeness of the mom and the baby, with um, pharmacologic intervention. There's chemicals in milk that babies are ingesting that may have analgesic effects, and also psychological interventions. So just the fact that the baby's um, being close to the mom. We also have baby sucking which can contribute to the baby's soothing. So breastfeeding is very effective for painful medical procedures and in fact is the routine way that pain is managed in a hospital setting in infants and is a very effective as well for reducing pain during vaccine injections. It's ideally started right before the vaccine injections and it's continued during the needle poke and vaccine injection and then afterwards. And if it can't be done for whatever reason, then trying to simulate it with uh, a bottle with express breast milk or formula or doing other things that simulate breastfeeding would be uh, good choices. So for instance, having mother holding the baby close or father holding the baby close um, and giving a sweet tasting solution and non-nutritive sucking, something like that. You see here positioning interventions. So uh, common practice again in hospital settings for neonates is to place them naked but for their diaper on their mother's chest between her breasts. This is called skin-to-skin -skin contact or kangaroo care. Infants and young children should be held upright during needle procedures. This reduces their anxiety because being supine, you may know yourself from your own experiences. We tend to be more anxious when we're lying down than when we're sitting upright. We feel like we're more in control when we're sitting upright. So this should be done in children as soon as they can sit upright and as well in adults. And there's one uh, intervention underneath positioning here, tactile stimulation, which refers to uh, providing a rubbing sensation using an external vibrator device. So this has been demonstrated to reduce pain in kids. It's not quite sure how it works, if it's just a very potent distractor. And here you see an example of a commercially available product. It's called a Buzzy Bee and it's available in the United States. It's uh, something you put on top of the arm, on top of where you're going to inject, and it vibrates, so it can be very distracting. It's not sure also if that uh, tactile stimulation is providing some white noise, but underneath it, there's a pad with an ice pack, and you can put that on the skin. So it's not sh we're not sure which parts of these uh, intervention, this intervention works to reduce pain. It might be a combination of all these items. And finally, the bottom one on this page, muscle tension, is an intervention that we use for people who are prone to fainting. So you don't actually need to be afraid of a needle to faint. Some people do faint when they have procedures and they can be taught to uh, tense large muscle groups like their legs during the procedure and this prevents them from having the dip in blood pressure that causes them to faint. So the next uh, category of interventions are the pharmacological interventions, and there are three of them, topical anesthetics, sweet tasting solutions, so I mentioned these two already, and the third one is vapor coolants. So topical anesthetics reduce pain during needle procedures in people of all ages, despite the fact that they don't penetrate uh, the skin beyond a few millimeters, they still reduce pain from both subcutaneous and intramuscular injections. They have a few challenges associated with their use, though. Firstly, they cost money, and secondly, they require time to work. So they need between 20 and 60 minutes, depending on the product that you're using. So you need to plan for their use ahead of time. Otherwise, if there's time in the vaccination appointment, you can apply them right there at the clinic because people tend to wait, on average, about 30 minutes anyway, so there is enough time to accommodate them in the clinic. 
Sweet tasting solutions have analgesic effects in young children. They are commonly used like topical anesthetics are in hospital settings for procedural pain management. We're not sure exactly how sweet tasting solutions work. Again, if they're potent distractors or if they actually re release endogenous opioids through the, free, the taste perception or through the sweet taste on the tongue. Regardless, there's uh, dozens of studies demonstrating reduced crying and distress when they're used during vaccination. We typically use sucrose, which is table sugar, uh, but otherwise glucose can work as well. In a hospital or institutional setting, both of these are available. They can be purchased. In a community setting, people can make it themselves. All they have to do is mix a packet of sugar with about 10 mils of water and give some to the baby right before the injection. Uh, but it's important to note that if a baby is two or four months of age, uh, where they're getting also the oral rotavirus vaccine, they can actually administer, the immunizer can actually administer the rotavirus vaccine first before the injectable vaccines and achieve the same result as giving sweet tasting solutions. And that is because the rotavirus contains quite a high concentration of sugar or sucrose, in fact, an even higher concentration of sucrose than is, the, than is present in the concentrations of sucrose that we use for analgesia. And finally, at the bottom there, I have vapor coolants. Vapor coolants are chemicals that immediately evaporate when they're applied to the skin, so kind of like alcohol, only they cause a very intense cold sensation when they're applied, and this is believed to reduce pain and the con conduction of pain signals through the skin. They've not been demonstrated to reduce pain in children, and that might have to do with the fact that that feeling of that cold sensation might actually be painful to some people. It's actually not comfortable for a lot of people. But also spraying this intensely cold uh, solution or chemical on the skin might make kids pay attention to the needle more, whereas otherwise they might have not even noticed it. But in adults, there's limited evidence that it might be helpful. We're not sure how much of this is a placebo effect. Regardless, this is not an easy intervention to be able to offer because it's not commercially available except in an institutional setting. So you can only buy it in an institution. You can't go to a drugstore and get it. Finally, it's psychological interventions. Distraction is taking someone's attention away from a pain, and this works to reduce pain. It can be effective across the lifespan, but it's a little bit tricky. You need to use the right approach uh, and engage it at the right time. In younger children, it's particularly important that uh, parents don't replace other interventions like physical comfort with distraction because physical comfort is a basic develop need, developmental need for young kids. So instead of uh, waving toys in front of babies, parents should be holding babies close and rocking them. And when babies' distress is sufficiently reduced, they can introduce a toy and try to engage the baby's attention in the toy. But what you notice about this slide here under distraction is that really uh, we don't have a lot to offer adolescents. So interestingly, even though adolescents get a lot of vaccine injections in the school setting, there are no uh, studies for psychological interventions that have been demonstrated to work. And we need to do more research in this area to be able to identify some feasible interventions that can be used in schools. And finally, at the bottom there, you see the category that we call uh, interventions during vaccine visits, immunizers, and parents, if parents are there, are communicating with individuals who are undergoing vaccination and onlookers. And unsurprisingly, what we say or what they say and do might influence how the needle procedure is experienced. Oftentimes, the natural comments or responses that people give actually work to increase pain and distress. And we call these behaviors distress-promoting behaviors. So they include using anxiety-provoking pro words like the word hurt or pain, reassurance statements, it'll be over soon, and false suggestions, for example, saying it won't hurt. So rather than do these things, other approaches should be used. Use neutral words to cue the procedure, say something like, here I go, instead of, oh, this is going to sting now just for a bit. Avoid simple repeated reassurance statements. They put somebody's attention on the procedure and on the pain. And don't lie to people or suggest something is going to reduce pain that won't. This not only doesn't work to reduce pain, it promotes mistrust, which undermines relationships with patients. 
Next slide is about interventions that are recommended for people with high levels of needle fear. The first is a psychological intervention called exposure therapy. It involves facing fears gradual, gradually under the guidance of a trained healthcare provider. So here people identify parts of the procedure that they find scary and they rank those from the least scary part to the most and presumably the most has to do with getting the needle procedure itself and then they work with somebody to be not afraid of all those things individually so they talk about them they look at pictures they might handle the items if they're items until they're not afraid and they work their way up to getting the procedure and at the bottom we have an intervention that combines exposure therapy with muscle tension that I mentioned from before and this is for people who have high levels of needle fear but that also faint so if you have a high level of needle fear you also have a higher tendency to faint than someone who's not afraid so in this case you can combine the exposure therapy with muscle tension and finally, this list shows some of the interventions which have not been demonstrated to be useful. And it's important to show people this to make sure that they're not doing things that they think are helping when actually they're not helping to reduce the pain from the vaccine injections. So they include administering oral analgesics like acetaminophen or ibuprofen right before the needle poke. Uh, an hour before the needle, needle poke or something like that to reduce pain from the needle poke. Manual tactile stimulation, so instead of using that buzzer I showed you, trying to rub near the site hasn't been shown in large studies to make a difference. Warming the vaccine by rubbing it between your hands or your palms, not been shown to make a difference. And then vapor coolants I mentioned before, not helpful for children. So how do we work to get the information out there so that people can change how immunization looks to match what the pamphlets are saying. We've been doing a little bit of work in this regard and it's really the stakeholder organizations that are helping us to get the word out. Our targets are primarily clinicians and uh, otherwise individuals who are getting immunized as well as parents if the individuals getting immunized are children. So we have included in our guideline research evidence showing that if you target these populations and you teach them about what to do, you actually can achieve better pain care. These people will use analgesic interventions more often. In our previous uh, guideline from 2010, we had an earlier version which we've now updated to our 2015 guideline. We had prepared some template tools that people could use in their practices. So firstly, we created the clinical practice guideline itself. And then you see here parts of pamphlets directed to parents. And you see documentation tools that clinicians could use to document what they were doing and even video clips to show how to use the different analgesic interventions because people find that once they see a picture of somebody getting sugar water or somebody breastfeeding during the immunization, it makes it much easier for them to know how to do it. So we have some of these resources already. Most of them are available on the Immunize Canada website. And there are some other websites that are posted on this slide here where they have the information. And also they're included in Immunize Canada's app. We've run some studies with implementing this information, as I said, targeting clinicians or targeting parents. And one of these studies that I just want to let you know about, it involved uh, the province of British Columbia and some public health units there. So we worked with the British Columbia Center for Disease Control to test some of our recommendations from our 2010 guideline and to see if it can make a difference in uh, healthcare providers' use of interventions and their own attitudes about their vaccine delivery. So this slide summarizes what it is we did to teach them. We uh, gave them a presentation. A health manager used a PowerPoint presentation and taught them for an hour or two about the pain management strategies. They had some practice scenarios that they went through. They had a list of Q&A that they posted and they had online support if questions came up from the immunizers. They also had some material support from the government in terms of supplies like sucrose solution to be able to give to babies. In another study, we worked with St. Michael's uh, outpatient pediatric clinic, again, to target the education to parents to see how it might make a difference in what they do during immunization. So in this case, 
we provided the clinic with pamphlets. Again, these are similar to the pamphlets that are posted on the Immunize Canada website. We played our video on their um, clinic waiting room television. So a lot of clinics have televisions in the waiting room. So we played our video so parents who are waiting for vaccinations could be looking at the video before and then know what they could ask for or what they could do. There were posters in the clinic rooms where kids were getting vaccinated. So again, that validated for the parent uh, as well as taught them that uh, there were things that could be done. And the unit made available sucrose solution in case parents wanted to use it. So the next slide is summarizing the results of uh, the interventions or these educational programs. The two studies that I talked to you about are study number one and two, and you can see what a difference it made to the use of pain interventions. The second column tells you the relative increase in the use of specific interventions that we were getting people to try to use. So we were particularly interested in promoting breastfeeding, for example, holding, topical anesthetics, sugar water. So here you see the gains that were made in these studies when we educated those people or those groups of people and number three and four are other studies that I didn't talk about but they were targeting parents and you see from the fourth column there what the context was so the first study was public health clinics the second study as I mentioned was outpatient pediatric clinic third was prenatal class and the fourth was hospital postpartum unit so you can see there's lots of opportunities to be able to teach people what to do and the gains you get are a little bit are good in general but they're a little bit dependent on uh, where people are at so the biggest gains can be made when you're targeting uh, individuals in the setting at the point of care where the vaccines are being delivered which is not very surprising so in conclusion then, pain and fear during vaccination is common, but doesn't need to be. There are lots of ways to prevent pain and fear. The pain treatments work. They're relatively cheap, so for the most part, they can be implemented in different clinical settings, actually without any added costs. We obviously need to work together as partners to allow us to achieve these practice changes to get people to know what to do, which will improve the experience of vaccination and reduce the potential harm of pain, which is that people acquire needle and others, children, and even adults look to healthcare providers about their care. They trust that we're looking out for them and that we care about them and their concerns. Pain certainly is a way for us to know um, that people care about us is when they take care of us when we're in pain. Thank you for your attention. Lucy, I'm done. So we can uh, start with the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tardio, for the excellent presentation. Please, uh, please mute your uh, microphone. Um, given uh, what you've discussed regarding um, implementation of the guidelines what do you perceive in your experience have been the biggest challenges to implementing the guidelines okay. implementing the guidelines that's a great question Lucy I think the biggest uh, challenge to implementing the guidelines is for people to know um, again getting to the whose responsibility it is and making it available to people who need to know it so I think the primary groups are as I said the parents of children as well the health care providers who are giving vaccine injections so if there's a way to communicate to these people at different points in their care or when they access the health care system for parents and families but for health care providers as part of their regular uh, training or education or communications either with their colleges or organizations or through public health affiliations if there's ways for they, them to have policies to draw on that would be a tremendous help to us to getting the message out because as I said people in general are not um, unwilling to manage pain they really actually the most common reason they give for not doing something about it is they don't know how they don't they don't know that there's things that they can do and um, they don't know how to implement that. So just just a little bit of time to show them can make a big difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I have another question for you. Uh, following the study in BC, did they continue to use sucrose solution in public health immunization clinics? 
Thank you for the question. So the, the study you're referring to was a pilot study we carried out with BCCDC after we had written our first guideline. They tested the guideline in a couple of uh, health regions to see if it could be done and what uh, gains could be made. And they decided after running the trial that they would adopt the guidelines. So they integrated all of the recommendations from the guideline in their immunization policy, which covers the entire province. And as part of their um, decision to do that, they put some resources into implementing the guideline which included educating all the healthcare providers that are administering vaccines and as well providing the costs of uh, giving sucrose solution. So they are currently paying for sucrose solution and public health immunizers are using sucrose for babies. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you. Have there been uh, specific organizations, whether within the Helping Kids and Adults team or outside, um, that have adopted the... We've had the World Health Organization just release a new guideline for pain mitigation during vaccination where they've adopted many of the interventions that we recommend in our guideline. So we now have an international organization, the World Health Organization, who has um, released a guideline on managing pain during immunization. So as people will know, the World Health Organization controls vaccine delivery in many countries. So, so there's going to be many countries where this is going to happen because it's now policy at WHO. Other countries lurk, look to the World Health Org Organization for standards and norms of practice. So it means that others are expected to adopt these interventions as well. So that's really great news beyond our group that we have the World Health Organization adopting these guidelines too. Perfect. We have uh, one follow-up question re regarding to the adoption of uh, Sucro Solution in BC. Uh, do you happen to know what product they were using during the study and are currently using? No, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the name of the product, but I can probably offline find out what it is and let people know. To my knowledge, I think there's really only one a distributor of uh, sucrose solution in Canada, so it's likely that that's the one that everybody's buying it from. So it wouldn't be just BCCDC, but it's also all the hospitals across Canada that are using sucrose routinely are purchasing it as well. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Tadio, for answering these questions and for your wonderful presentation. Are there any other questions for Dr. Tadio? Okay, so we have reached the end of the webinar. Um, I would like to thank all participants for being a part of this wonderful webinar. A link to the webinar evaluation will be circulated by the PHPC Secretariat this afternoon. I encourage all participants um, to complete the evaluation. Your feedback is important um, and therefore uh, any feedback you can provide will inform future webinars. Thank you once again for participating in today's webinar and good afternoon.